So over the past few weeks, I have been sharing some of the things that I learned over my 12-week summer sabbatical or vacation, if that's what you want to call it. And during that time, as you can imagine, when all of a sudden you go from working sometimes 40 to 60 hour weeks, and all of a sudden you get that 40 to 60 hours back, there is a lot of extra time. And as we all know, having that extra time can be both a blessing and a curse because we can choose to use that time wisely <laughs> or we can choose to uh, spend it frivolously. And I will admit I did a little bit of both. Having that extra time was amazing to get back into some healthy spiritual practices, as I talked about last week with my prayer life, my study, and my praying through Scripture. I had a practice that when we were home, when we weren't away on vacation, that when I would get up in the morning, my first thing that I would do would be to kind of go downstairs and, and put the cup of coffee on and then go back up to my room and I would spend about half an hour to 45 minutes in kind of study and prayer time. And that was healthy time. And the reason that I love doing that was because I have this awesome chair and I got it from my mentor and friend Obed uh, almost uh, 15 years ago when I moved into the house that we are in now. And at the time he gave it to me, it was a uh, chair that he had already used well. And it is a yellow leather recliner. And we affectionately call it the butter chair. Because not only does it look like butter, but it is just so soft and, and it kind of curves to your you know, body and it just kind of envelops you. And it's actually our cat's favorite chair too. She, whenever you sit down in that chair, she is like right there. And over the years, we've put a, a covering on it, but it's still that wonderful place to just go and be in the presence of God. And so that practice just became one of those awesome times each day. And I would always sort of end that time feeling so rejuvenated and refreshed and ready for the day. But I also had a bad habit. Anybody have a bad habit out there? Okay. <laughs> Everybody's like, eh, yeah. One or two. Um, but one of mine is that when I have some extra time, sometimes I let it get away from me. And I have this thing called a cell phone. Anybody have a cell phone? And it's a smartphone, which I'm not sure that's always the correct term for it, but it has these things called apps on there. And... They're real easy to press on that app and go into a different world. And those of you who have ever been or are on currently in social media, you know that if you go on to things like Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, you are transported into a whole different world, a world that's connected globally. And that can be very good but it can also be very unhealthy. Because sometimes when I would go in after my prayer and devotional time, I would go into Facebook and I would see the things that I was hoping to see, you know, pictures of friends doing fun things or, you know, uh, seeing a, an update about somebody that I haven't talked to in a long time and, and seeing what's going on in their life. You know, that's ultimately what social networking was supposed to be about. But 
we know that it's also been transformed into other things. And I tell you that one of the reasons that it was such a bad habit to go right from my prayer and devotional time into the, the social media world was because in the social media world, I was seeing people be awful to other people. Like, if you don't want to be depressed, don't, don't, don't go into the comment section on a news article. Because if it has anything to do with politics, the dividing lines are there, and I've seen and heard and, and, and read some things that I just can't imagine one person saying to another person. And you're seeing all of the, the things that, while on one side you're seeing some really positive, awesome things that are happening in people's lives and in the world, and on the other side you're just seeing just the most awful, heinous stuff that's happening. And daily reminders of how we are being hurtful and cruel to one another. When we're seeing the, the, the news cycle on a daily basis and, and we're seeing the fear that is created by some of the events in our world. And I can tell you that sometimes when I would hit that button and pull myself back out of that app and out of that world, I have to admit there were some times I was really, really shaken. Really, really upset. And in some ways fearful for the way that we are treating community and treating individuals and treating our world. But God has this amazing way of placing things in our lives that help us come back into balance. And in my room, in direct line of sight, so sitting in the butter chair, looking out, I have this frame, and it's a framed copy of a bulletin from a, a funeral that a member so lovingly put together for me um, and, and gave to me. And it says, be still and know that I am God. And that was my balance point. That when I would come out of that world shaken, anxious, this was my good reminder that God is God. That God is in control. And that my job at that moment was to be still and to let God be God. And be still and know that I am God is a verse of Scripture that I think many of us turn to in times of difficulty and trouble and grief for that very same reason. That in those times where we just don't know where to turn, it helps us to remember that we are always held by God. And this is a verse that quotes God directly. But it does not come from God's many conversations with Abraham in the book of Genesis, nor does it come with his confab with Moses at either the burning bush or on Mount Sinai when he's handing over the law and the commandments. Nor is it at the time where God is speaking directly to the people through the prophets. No, this verse is found in one of King David's poetic journal entries in the Psalms. Now, 
David, whose story, the heart of his story, can really be found in First and Second Samuel in the Old Testament, was often in trouble. He was often running from enemies, both foreign and domestic. In fact, there was a time in his life when he was a warrior for King Saul, going off to fight all of his battles against enemies who constantly wanted to conquer and use Israel. Because if you look on a map, Israel is in an amazing uh, ge- geographical space. It's, it's basically like a super highway in the ancient world. That if you wanted to move goods or, or military or anything through that part of the world, you needed to control Israel. And so you can imagine how many nations, the Assyrians, the, the Philistines, the Babylonians, they all wanted Israel. And David was the warrior that was sent out to do battle against all of these nations. And you would think that's enough, right? Just to be battling against those foreign enemies. But then he had his own king who was so jealous of him who believed that David was always gunning for him, gunning to become king himself, even though David was anointed as a boy by God as king. David always was following and respectful of Saul, but Saul could never see that. And so Saul began to send his own men after David. And so there are many times when David was on the run, hiding in caves, fearful for his life, both from those foreign and domestic enemies. Never knowing who to trust, never knowing what he was going to find when he woke up the next day. And so you can imagine when he is writing in his journal, when he is laying out what we now know of as the Psalms, or many of them attributed to to David, you can almost sense the moments when David was writing some of these Psalms. So thinking about that context, listen again to these first few lines of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He's stating some of those fears, but also stating his belief, his faith, knowing that God is the one who will ultimately be there to be the balance point, to to be the refuge, to be the one that circles and protects him. And then we have this direct quote from God. And where does that come from? Well, it, it comes from David. David wrote it. But where did he hear it? Well, he heard it in prayer. Because as we talked about last week, prayer is a two-way street. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation between us and God. And so as David pours out his heart to God, he then listens. And this is the response that he gets. Be still and know that I am God. And the Hebrew word translated as be still is rapha. 
And it literally is a, a, a word in Hebrew that means to let go. And so it's a place where you may have heard that saying, let go and let God. That's a big piece of, of where that comes from, is from this Hebrew word, rafa. But it doesn't just mean to let go. It also means to be quiet. It says to be quiet and remember that I am God. And Mark Batterson, in his book, Whisper, writes about the importance of being quiet and being silent and how that affects our faith life and how it improves our faith life. It builds our faith life. It grows it. And he says in his book that, as we, many of us have experienced, it's hard to tune out the voices of others, the call of social media, and the constant demands to do more and be more. But he says, silence helps us hear God's voice and sing God's song. Silence is the difference between sight and insight. Silence is the difference between happiness and joy. Silence is the difference between fear and faith. He goes on to say that the white noise of the world might be the greatest impediment to our spiritual growth. He says, by definition, white noise is a sound that contains every frequency that a human ear can hear. And because it contains every frequency, it's very difficult to hear any frequency, especially the still, small voice of God. And he says, when our lives get loud... With noise filling every frequency, we lose our sense of being. When our schedules get too busy, we lose our self sense of balance. That's how we forget that God is God. Simply put, God often speaks loudest when we're quietest. But Rafa has one more meaning as well. It also means to abate, to stop, to halt. And when we look at Scripture, if you were to turn to Psalm 46.10 right now, you would see that at the end of that small, simple verse, there's not a period, there's not a comma, there's not a semicolon, there's an exclamation point. And that's on purpose, because there's an emphasis here. In the silence... God is saying, stop, halt, right where you are, and remember that I am God. That's a powerful thing, to think that in the midst of our prayers and all of our fears and all of the things that we are laying out before God because we just don't know where to turn. And God's response is, stop. Slow down right now. I want to talk to you. I want to be there with you, but in order to do that, you have to stop, and we have to be 
in silence together. Because that's where you're going to hear me, says God. But we also have to remember that being still does not mean that we end up doing nothing. Because it's real easy for us to say, okay, I've stopped, I've remembered God, that you are God, that you are in control, that that you have the, the power to change things. That's the foundation. That's where we start from, to realize that we're not in control. But we also need to remember that God gives us the abilities and the gifts to go out and make a difference in our world. That when we have fears and concerns that what when we feel like we should be doing something, that's when we do need to stop and listen and to say, God, what is it that I am supposed to do? And I think if we get into that listening mode, when we can start to hear God speak in those still small ways to us that nudge us and urge us to do maybe one thing that day or to go to a place where maybe we're going to meet somebody that we're supposed to meet that day. Or maybe we pay attention to a conversation we might have overlooked before. We're doing something. And Christ is a perfect example of showing us how we are called to act and how we are called to be servants in the service of others. Because I believe Christ came to show us how much God loves us, that God truly is in control. But we also see that Christ was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice to show us that no matter what, we are beloved and saved and redeemed. So we're also called to take risks, to help others, to care for others, to share the good news of Jesus Christ in ways where people don't want to hear it or they have closed themselves off from it or they are so angry and bitter and hurtful that they just can't yet realize that when we let Christ into our hearts, changed and transformed for the better. And in his book, The Circle Maker, Mark Batterson talks about how when we come to this understanding of how powerful God is and how God is always working for our good, that our job is to pray like it depends on God and act like it depends on us. That that is the formula for transforming ourselves and our world in the model and the image of Christ Jesus. Pray like it depends on God. Act like it depends on you. Thanks be to God. Amen.